Good morning, Rotarians and guests. Good morning. Good morning, Ron. I'm Ron Strobel, the Sergeant at Arms, and uh, we welcome all of you this morning. The invocation this morning is by Jim Ahern. Sorry, I. I, I, I knew who it was supposed to be, but I didn't see you. <laughs> I wasn't the only one standing up, that's for sure. Uh, with all that's going on in the world today, and uh, our president is going to be making a talk tonight, I thought I would uh, have the invocation uh, based on prayers to our country. Uh, Lord, we lift up prayer for our country. We ask that you would bless our country with your wisdom, your love, and your compassion. May we be a people who are pursuing you and your plans for us individually and collectively. Lord, we also ask blessings for our leaders. May these servants who are in positions of authority take that responsibility seriously and do their very best each day. May they realize their need for you and your direction. May they hear your voice as they make their decisions and may they follow your guidance. Lastly, Lord, we ask blessings for our service men and women. We ask protection for all our men and women in uniform, both here and the around the world. We are grateful for their service and their dedication to keeping our nation safe, and we pray that you would keep them safe. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. And to lead us in the pledge and the four-way test, Catherine Sines. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And for the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do, do first, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And to lead us in song this morning, Dick Pearsall. <laughs> America the Beautiful was written by Catherine Lee Bates as she traveled by train from the West Coast to the Midwest. I think she did a wonderful job. We have it in small, uh, in <clears throat> small print here. I think most of you know it. But anyway, we're going to sing America the Beautiful. <laughs> Oh, beautiful, for spacious skies, for amber waves of rain, for purple mountains, majesties above the fruited plain. Hit it now. America, America, God shed his rays on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. She'd be proud of that, I think. <laughs> and now our president, Allison Feaster. Thanks, Ron. Welcome, everybody. And we survived our week of babysitting for the three grandkids. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. The grandkids survived too? Yes, they survived too. Even though we had to go to the emergency room for a scratch cornea for the six-year-old, but all is well. So, who's making a difference? We are. How are we making a difference? Lighting up Rotary together. Let's try it again. How are we making a difference? Lighting up Rotary together. Thank you. Want to thank also our AV team. Samantha, we're so glad you're here to help us out. And James is here helping as well. Nice to see you back, James. And we've got uh, Larry. See if I've got my list here. So we've got Jimmy Sutphin, Ron Barnhouse, Tom Page, Larry Santon, and of course our famous James Field. So next, moving right along, we'll have Chris Barker. No guests. How about our speakers? Do you want to just stand up and say hi? <laughs> Marsha Booty. She'll be. 
If not, you'll be on your own. <laughs> well, well done, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All righty, Chimmy Sudfin. <laughs> oh, I guess we'll wait for Jimmy. How about Tom? He's standing here ready to go. Between 3 and 6 on Saturday, you're going to meet some of you. You're going to meet me and Larry uh, over at Veterans Way Park for the uh, picnic. If you're not dedicating a building, be there, okay? And uh, this list that's, that you guys and gals signed up on, I need to know what, what you're going to bring, a salad or a dish or something like that. So if you would uh, write that, and if there's anybody else that wants to sign up, i got extra pages. So I'll start over here and pick it up at the end. Thank you. We have a birthday we'd like to celebrate. We have a card for our retired Rotarian Bob Hills. So I'm going to pass this around. I appreciate it if you would. It's all dressed ready to go. So, and the pen's right there. So please do so. And um, also, uh, t be sure to watch our, <coughs> our programs on uh, Hudson Cable. The new intro that has been added uh, <coughs> is really quite good. It's quite different. And uh, I think, and of course, I, I'm very anxious to watch last week's program when we had Ken Fogel here to talk about Gift of Life. So if you were not here last week you had, and you would have maybe missed that meeting, this is a great way to pick that up. And also, speaking about service above self, I'd just like to recognize a couple people. Uh, Joe Rusnak, who headed up Hudson Job Search for many years in August or September of 2010. Uh, Jim Ahern very kindly stepped up and uh, so in fact thanks Joe because now Jim is a member of Hudson Rotary but that is an awesome job Hudson Job Search and we want to thank Joe and Jim. All right are we ready to play Rotary Jeopardy? Hey. Hey. We need some music don't we? Okay ready we know the rules Ron? I'll give you the clue. You give the answer, don't, the form. Don't spit out the answer right away. Raise your hand first and be recognized. Where's right. your badge? Okay. There's your badge. Where's your arm? Uh -oh. Oh, oh. Fine. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's in his car. Likely story. At least it's not in the mail. <laughs> All right. Baba Black Sheep, have you any? <laughs> Great job. Well, let me finish. Do you know how long it takes me to come up with these? <laughs> All righty, here we are. Baba Black Sheep, have you any? Ah, uh, sorry, but alas, this Rotarian has no wool. Bill Woolridge. Yay! <laughs> Did you not get it, Bill? Okay, now he gets it. And Duncan, you can go fly a kite. Oh, this goes with my silly bunny. I love this place. Oh, he just comes for the toys, we know. All righty, Craig Tallman, are you ready? Have a presentation about the foundation and what you need to know about it. Good morning, everybody. We have a jump drive. That's not quite it. We need the uh, third. It's the third one. It's on there. There's three. Yeah, there you go. HRF grant budget, please. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they worked on that long and hard to come up with that kind of a deal. So that's our, that's our committee structure there. What I wanted to do this morning, um, Allison and I want to make a habit of once a month uh, having a few minutes in front of the club to talk about 
uh, the many things that the foundation board is, tr is trying to achieve throughout the, uh, the fiscal year. So this morning, I thought what I'd do is, is share with you. And James, can we go back to that budget? It's the budget I want to get up there. There's two. We'll get to this one in a moment. But nonetheless, I wanted to share with you, you know, the budget that the foundation board has passed for this fiscal year. And I want to begin to help all of us understand, you know, how do we get to the end of our uh, objective for the end of the year in terms of the monies we've got to raise and so forth. And uh, it's a quick illustration, but we'll get there in a second. Yeah. We're going to come back to this, but i got to show, get to the budget side first. Meanwhile, I um, wanted to bring light to the idea that uh, Denrich and Larry have been working to automate the uh, grant request form, okay? And it's, now how do we get there? Okay. But anyway, long and short is, if you go on our website, um, in the future, those who are wanting to apply for a, uh, submit a grant to the foundation board, they'll be able to do that online. And that information will carry over uh, electronically to the grant committee members so that we can quickly assess and vote on it. And uh, Larry, being the chairperson of the grant committee, can accumulate the votes uh, in a reasonable amount of time and we can you know, move forward in the process. This is a huge improvement compared to the paper process that we had previously. So you had a number of people, thank you very much. Uh, anybody that had submitted grants in the past did so by downloading a, a paper form off our website and having to fill it out manually and submit material with it. Uh, we're moving away from that process and, and, and put it online <laughs> automatically. So if we can go to the top here, what um, the revenue side is really what I want to focus on. So as you can see down for total revenues, we have budgeted a balanced budget this year of $66,500 uh, in monies that we c categorize as revenues coming in. And there's a couple of things here that are, that are of note. First off, the fall fundraiser, you can see last year we did raise $10,846. Thank you very much, Tom, and those that helped you. But this year's budget's got a little bit of a stretch goal in there of $11,000. Uh, so we are dependent on that. When you look at the auction revenue there, again, 48744 and congratulations again to Ron and so forth, and Ron has a question already. The number's incorrect uh, because of a, an issue with the credit cards, and that number's actually um, $10,350 higher. There you go. Good, then we'll raise, we can raise the goal then for the budget for this year. If we assume the logic's going to be the same and we're going to net out something like $58,000, we can adjust the budget for this year. That would give us some, uh, some well, uh, leeway. The reason I make the point is that uh, when you get down to the expenses as well, um, you know, that, we have questions there, but the, the revenue is, is in there. I don't know. Okay. Rich, do you have a comment on that? <laughs> yeah, just to uh, let you know, we filed the 990 with that 48,744. Joe Avella, where he's at in this room, and I went back and put the 10,353 into last year, and we revised that number upwards. So that way the profit will be closer to what Ron, Gail, and everybody else on the committee would hope, hope to have it close to 40 grand on a net basis. Well, that's all good news because one of my points I was going to make to this group this morning was how stressed we are in terms of the monies available to do the grants we want to make for this year. So I look at this as nothing but good news. So, Ron, I may invite you to the board meeting next week, and you can help us understand where that money's at. We can readjust the budget accordingly. It's in the bank so now. We'll go from there. Rich knows where it is. Okay, good. The second thing I want to bring to everybody's attention is the annual appeal. And this is something we started last year, but we've got an aggressive goal this year of raising $5,000 for what we're calling an annual appeal, which is targeted to be a year-end objective this year. Duncan Campbell Tanner Junior, uh, Junior is the chairperson of our Resource Development Committee and uh, doing some wonderful work in great detail as to how this campaign will be rolled out this year and the objective and how we're going to get ourselves involved with the focus towards that. But as you can see there, given what the information we knew at the time, the, uh, the revenues do sum up to a number of $66,500. Now, if we can push it up, James, to the expense side. Just for a moment, quickly. Oh, sorry. 
All right. A little bit too high there. There we go, there we go, there we go. You can see on the grants line, we've budgeted $23,500 or three, $23,350 in grants this year. Uh, taking into consideration uh, the legacy of several grant requests that we work with on an annual basis. And then again, you know, working in mind with the thought mind, thought and process in our heads about the scholarship programs and the proceeds from the gala event as well as developing a miscellaneous fund as well. Uh, you can see on the uh, scholarships, we've budgeted 13,000 as compared to 12,500. And another thing of note here, the transfer to the permanent fund. Last year, the Foundation uh, Board Investment Committee uh, created a policy that, that basically explained that the Foundation Board needs to direct $5,000 on an annual basis to the permanent fund in order for that fund to grow uh, in its core value and uh, you know, certainly get to a point one day in the future that we can have less dependency on the activities we you know, pursue to raise monies and greater dependency on the endowment fund itself. Now, that's a, a long ways away, but we gotta keep working at it. So the goal was set to you know, move $5,000 in that direction on an annual basis. Unfortunately, given the resources, which we may rethink now that we have additional monies to work with here, apparently, um, we were only budgeting $1,750 of that number this year to move to the permanent fund. So that's lower than what we'd like to do, um, but given this new information here, perhaps we can rethink that and uh, get closer to our target of $5,000 this year. But again, you can see on the expense side, it does balance out uh, with the revenue side that we had forecasted given the information we had. I'm sorry, James, can we go to the second one now? Just to kind of give everybody an illustration of what is planned for here right now on, on grants. If we could go to the top, there you go, okay. What you see here is a format that's been used by the foundation board for the last few years. Uh, works. It's a very quick snapshot of some of the things we have had uh, history with in the past, dif different events and things that we do fund. Uh, it speaks to the budgeted uh, amount from the previous year and then the amount paid if it was requested and then what do we budget for this year, okay? Um, and unfortunately, there are a few uh, events and, and causes that we have had a relationship in the past that we have not budgeted monies for this year because of the scarcity of funds. And so again, you know, we may rethink this given some new information here from this morning's discussion on the gala event uh, and, and we most likely will, but I think what this does is bring light to a couple things. Number one, we have such a desire to fund a number of Hudson-related activities across the entire year. Um, and overall, we do a pretty good job. And some of these grants are not all that large. Typically, we get asked for things of $1,000 and higher. In many cases, we're not, we can't give them $1,000. We may be able to give them half their request. And that happens often. So when I talk about the annual appeal and what the work that Duncan's doing on top of the traditional things such as a fall fundraiser and or the gala event, it is a new element that we're dependent on here to give us that boost that allows us to be you know, more generous to our community needs as we look down the road here in time. Um, keeping in mind also the permanent fund needs that we think we need to fund on an annual basis. So. I will, I will leave it as a work in progress at this point. We'll, we'll look at the new data on the numbers we've got to work with here and, and see if we can't uh, uh, balance things out in a little more generous way. But uh, this is what we have uh, essentially budgeted for this year. So any questions? Joe. Uh, Greg, you want to put 5000 per year in the permanent fund? No, yes, we do as an investment fund. Yeah. Yeah. What's the balance there now? Art, do you have a number? Little over, little over $124,000, yeah. Okay, well, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. We are having a foundation meeting next week after this meeting. You're welcome to attend. Uh, I'm sure we'll have more discussion on this topic matter as far as finalizing the exact numbers we're working with, and uh, we'll proceed accordingly, okay? Thank you for your time. Greg, can I ask you a quick question? Sure, Phil. This basically is a fixed list, so 
What happens if an organization wants to come in and request a grant that's not on that? Great question, Phil. And, you know, we have a category here for miscellaneous, and it's right here. Okay? Okay, cool. Um, we have some leeway to go. Uh, you know, this was, a, this was an interesting conversation when we first had it here about two months ago because we initially budgeted zero. Yeah. Okay? We just didn't feel like we had the monies given the intent and the desire for the auction feature grant to be at $15,000. So I think that's still a work in progress. But we want to, we, for example, today's meeting at the club board, you know, we are presenting a grant that was not budgeted that we think is a good thing to do. And so those things will come up. And we should, have the, we should be nimble enough to be able to adjust these things to, to address those particular needs because some of these needs are not annual needs. They're short-term needs that need our help, and we should be ready to do that. Okay, thank you. Again, if you have any questions, go to the board meeting next week. It's very interesting. Duncan, are you ready? I am, ma'am. Good morning, Good morning fellow history buffs. Before we embark on another historical journey through Rotary, we need to establish some clarification. My name is Duncan Campbell Tanner, Jr. Um, call me Duncan. Call me Dunk. My parents called me Cam, short for Campbell. I love it that you call me something, and a lot of you call me Tanner, because I really think that you thought my first name was Tanner. <laughs> All right. Um, there are other things you can call me. I think in the interest of decorum and a mixed audience, we'll pass on those. But um, yeah, Duncan, Dunk, Cam, Campbell, hey you. Thank you very much. I, I feel better. I, I hope you do too. <laughs> One more quick aside. A number of you were not present for last week's Feinmeister presentation. James Fields, John Archer, um, C. Chris Barker, you owe us some money. Yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you. John, good to see you, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Check, cash, credit card. All right. Pay my son's law school fees, whatever you think is right. Rotary and Executive Order 9066. In an atmosphere of post Pearl Harbor hysteria, President Roosevelt authorized the internment of tens of thousands of American citizens of Japanese ancestry and resident aliens from Japan. Executive Order 9066 gave the military broad powers to ban any citizen from a 50 to 60 mile coastal area stretching from Seattle to Phoenix and to transport these citizens to assembly centers and internment camps. Resident aliens of German and Italian ancestry were also included in this executive order, but of the 14,200 German and Italian aliens arrested, only 5,000 actually went to an internment camp. By the end of the war, nearly 120,000 Japanese American citizens and resident aliens, more than half of those children, were actually put in internment camps. Now, there's no defense for this, but we have to remember what was going on in the day. The hysteria right after the bombing of Pearl Harbor was such that Japanese Americans were singled out. Certainly, the shock of Pearl Harbor was a key part of that. The need to prevent espionage and invasion as we viewed it at the time was also part of the formula. The fact that the Japanese not too many years earlier had invaded Manchuria and committed more inhumane acts than probably in the history of Western civilization at that time also played in to this problem. But most importantly and most unfortunately the bottom line was this. There had been and continued to be in this country a pervasive prejudice against Japanese and the Oriental race dating all the way back to the early 1800s. So here we are. Conditions in these internment camps were at best Spartan. Entire extended families lived in 20 foot by 20 foot shacks. Medical care was sporadic. 
and there was no running water. Men over 17 had to take the following oath in order to be released. Number one, are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States? Number two, will you swear allegiance to the United States and forswear allegiance to the Emperor of Japan? Now, in April 1944, our own club hosted two Japanese-American young ladies, Mary Farashiko and Martha Fujita. They had grown up in internment camps in Manzanar, outside of Glendale, California. They were Akron U students at the time, and according to a Beacon Journal article the week afterwards, they had come to Rotary and toured other Rotary clubs in our district and around the state to tell this horrible story. This is a quote from the Beacon Journal. Members and guests sat silently as the young ladies recounted hunger, extreme heat and cold, unsanitary conditions, lack of privacy, and humiliation. Ladies in the audience were seen dabbing their eyes. Men turned away. Then the two students shared a story that brought more tears, this time tears of joy, to the room. Having worked out a special arrangement, that means they bribed the guards, Rotary Club members from the Glendale, California Club regularly brought food, blankets, books, and toys to the camp, usually under the cover of darkness. Years later, that same Rotary Club sponsored 1,500 students who traveled to Los Angeles from Glendale to tour the newly built Japanese American National Museum to learn more about the horrors of those internment camps. Now, some postscript notes. Ten individuals, ten individuals total, were actually convicted of spying on behalf of the Emperor of Japan. When the dust settled and the smoke clears, not one of them were Japanese American. They were all Caucasian. Number two, the most decorated army unit of the Second World War was comprised solely of Japanese Americans. It also suffered the highest casualties. And finally, in 1988, Congress formally apologizes to Japanese Americans, paying over $20,000 to each survivor. Thank you. Thanks for another great job, Duncan. That's very interesting. Or Tanner. <laughs> Cam Dunk. Here we go. Scotty. Scotty, just don't call him Sue, right? All righty. Jimmy, you ready? He's going to introduce our speakers today. Thank you, Allison. We have <clears throat> two speakers today to talk about Connie's bucket list. So I'm very anxious to hear about Connie's bucket list. Uh, Marsha Booty is from Hudson. Uh, unfortunately, she did <clears throat> ra be, was raised in Pittsburgh and was probably a Steeler fan, but. <laughs> in Mount Lebanon, but she has been in Hudson for over 50 years, so she's kind of a resident. Um, she's a semi-retired physical therapist, and uh, she is on the board of the, uh, the League for Women's Voters of Hudson. Her dad worked for Fisher Scientific, and a very interesting bit of information about the Booty family is that, how many people remember Andy Krasny? He was an inbound Rotary Exchange student from the Czech Republic. Czech Republic? Yes. Uh, they were host families for Andy. Along about, must be 12 years ago. Um, our second speaker, Jackie Mills, is from Warren, Ohio, and owns and operates an associated chiropractic center. Jackie and her late husband, Dr. Donald Mills, have traveled with Bud and Marcia to Big Sky, Montana, and Cozumel, Mexico. Uh, <clears throat> three weeks before their trip, Jackie served on a mission trip with the Ohio State University Master's Gardeners Program in Ecuador. She has been in Trumbull County, Ohio State University Master's Gardener since 1999, and is the, in the School of Enrichment Program and as a coordinator, serving 350 students in the Warren and 
Howland School Districts. She is a registered x-ray technician. She is an urban 4-H advisor. She has a boat. How do you pronounce the name? Dagnabbit. Dagnabbit. <laughs> a boat by the name of Dagnabbit. It sounds like when you run into the dock, I guess. <laughs> Which is, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a Cedar Point. She has a cat called Zora. And um, I think we're ready. Uh, Jackie and Marsha. Yeah, I thought I'd bring a piece of Ecuador with us this morning and just to show you that they do have community meetings all over the world. Yep. Okay, just to show you that Ecuador has community meetings all over the world. So. <laughs> well, I guess I'm just going to get started on how this all happened. Um, Bud and I have done business together over the years, and when we called to uh, place an order, he said, do you want to go to the Amazon with Marcia? And I said, sure. <laughs> and she didn't even invite me. He invited me. <laughs> so... Um, it was interesting because um, Marsha and um, it was actually Bud's childhood friend whose his wife is Connie, who I'd never met, and Connie's <laughs> friend Cindy. And then just before we were going, plans changed, and I ended up going to the Amazon by myself with her two friends. So um, I'll just touch a little bit about the Amazon trip because it was the beginning of our trip. Um, there were um, before I get started with anything, this was actually our transportation from, we flew into Quito, and then the next morning, um, we were going to the Amazon, we stayed at the Sasha Lodge. One thing I did learn is that if you're ever going to go from one place to the other, plan an extra day in between because the other two gals, their luggage didn't arrive. And I couldn't understand why they just can't send it to the Sasha Lodge. That's because transportation from Quito to the Sasha Lodge, we went from a uh, bus to a holding area, and then this was the taxi that took us down um, down the river. Oh, I gotta do, I'm not, this is not my thing. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying. And, um, And then this is where I thought we were arriving at the Sasha Lodge. I'm starting to take pictures, and then I've come to find out that um, this was our. We walked. Oh, I must admit, I have them out of order a little bit. Sorry. I also don't know how to do PowerPoint very well. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, I'm gonna probably have to. But um, we actually ended up walking from the taxi for probably hmm, an an hour. And then when we got to what I thought was close to being the Sasha Lodge, then we got into the canoes and then took the canoes <laughs> down to, here we are again, there's Connie, this is Connie. This is all her fault. <laughs> um, sorry. Now we're arriving at the Sasha Lodge and transportation only comes in um, twice a week, so that's the reason why their luggage couldn't make it. But it was a really lovely um, facility. The food was delicious. This is in the upper part of the lodge where, I don't know if you could see where they're sitting up there, um, looking out. You are assigned, this is our cabins that we stayed in. Um, they're open with screens along the top. Um, that was just a card that showed the two, three women. There's a swimming hole outside of the lodge. You're only allowed to swim between the hours of 10 and 4. And then what happens is, is you're assigned a, um, a group leader. And they did actually, by the way, catch piranhas out of that s swimming hole, <laughs> just so you know. Not, so that must be the time. And there's alligators in that area as well. <laughs> 
uh, anacondas as they call them. So, um, and we did swim there. I mean, it got it was pretty hot. It was refreshing, but the the um, the mosquitoes and the bugs were just horrific. Um, the first night that we arrived for dinner and got to our cabins, we were told to bring our flashlights with us, and you're assigned a leader and you stay with the same group of people the whole time. And your excursions every day were with the same group. There were six of us in our group. Um, the very first night after dinner, we had our meeting. Um, we brought our flashlights with us and had to show up. And we went out looking for anacondas. And we were in canoes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, like the movies. You know, you hear the sounds. It's pitch black. And you're flashing your lights to find the eyes of the anaconda and you're going over. It was really quite fun. <laughs> um, it was probably good that I didn't know about it ahead of time. But every day we went out at least two to three times a day on different adventures. Um, we went by canoe or we hiked. Um, we actually went out at night looking for um, scorpions and other different insects. The food was fabulous, <coughs> always seemed very fresh. This was the walk to our cabin from the main cabin. They also had a butterfly exhibit. Um, I came down that morning as we were going and I said, um, does my hat make me look like I'm a tourist? <laughs> <laughs> and there's Connie on the left and Cindy. And this is just what, you know, our one day for transportation going out. We were just learning about how they, um, we always had a native, the same native in the back, he did the paddling, and then we had a guide with us all of the time. <coughs> Sorry. Um, this was a Sasha Lodge coming back in one night for dinner. There's our guide. This is um, just something that the monkeys eat. We actually look for monkeys. <laughs> um, this is part of the butterfly exhibit. Um, this is more when we get into, right. then Marsha came. Yeah. <laughs> Saved the day. <laughs> um, we, after Amazon, we went back to Quito, uh, which they found their luggage. That was another thing. They bought the insurance for their luggage and they each had $500 to spend um, to buy new clothing for their trip in the Amazon. So you want to chat about this? Yeah. 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 We'll take yeah. turns. Yeah. <laughs> Is this the this one right here? Yes, that one. Oh, okay. And don't touch anything down there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, I arrived on Saturday, and because of scheduling, I was unable to do the Amazon, which was really disappointing to me because the, the gals obviously had a great time. Uh, we were picked up. The gals actually met their luggage. It finally arrived and met us at the hotel. And uh, you have to remember, uh, Ecuador is a third world country, and it um, actually was probably one of the easiest third world countries that I've been to in many years. Uh, first of all, uh, the... Um, the current, so if you want to recharge all your, your phones and things, of course, we couldn't use them. We couldn't get out of the country. <laughs> and our apps weren't working properly. But it is uh, U.S. current, so that's easy to deal with. The, uh, the money, the currency, is U.S. currency. Uh, do you remember the Sacagawea dollar no. years ago? And then they all disappeared? Well, they all went down to Ecuador. And what they did, part of the reason was they were so much like our, I believe it was the quarters, and they had edges on them. Well, what the Ecuadorians have done is they put a band of metal around that. So that's what they use. It's the, it's the U.S. dollar. There are U.S. dollars down there. However, they don't print them, so they get very worn and ragged, and you rarely see them in uh, circulation. But you use the U.S. dollar. Uh, actually, cost of living is, is very, very reasonable down there, and uh, you do see expats down there. So most of them are along the coastline because it's a very nice place to be. In fact, Jackie and I ran into, uh, coming back, we ran into an elderly gal, probably in her 80s, had been down there for the winter, and she had all her luggage all stacked up waiting to come back with us in, in April. We were here in April. It was, uh, and some of our pictures will reflect that, it was the beginning of Holy Week. 
uh, the next day, our uh, guide picked us up and uh, took us on the ubiquitous tour of the city of Quito. Quito is nestled in a group of uh, volcanoes, and so you are up quite high. I was telling Jimmy, even though you think you're in shape, uh, we were just out walking on the street, and if you're doing a fast trot down the street to one of the stores or the market or something, you'll find yourself getting out of breath very, very quickly. Uh, and even though we were there two weeks and um, two and a half when they were in a Amazon, you still find yourself, you know, looking for air. So if you have breathing problems, um, you know, it's a, it's a very challenging uh, place to be. They took us, first of all, actually, uh, to the highest point in uh, Quito, and they put us on uh, the funicular, which took us to the top, and where we could see the um, overlook the city and kind of get a view of how very, very dense the population is in that part of Ecuador. Uh, Quito, of course, is the capital. Uh, as I said before, it's, it is a third world country and sometimes you appreciate it, sometimes you don't. We arrived in a very, very modern airport. It's just been built, extremely efficient. And then you get on a bus and you travel down a two lane road and you wind down into the valley, and in order to get to, to Quito itself, you go over this rickety bridge, which literally, literally has been condemned. They are in the process of building, but of course it's based on government funds, and you all know how that goes. So uh, th you, that's the only way you get to the airport. So if you're leaving Quito and going to the airport, or you're coming in, you have to allow yourself at least an hour, hour and a half to go a very short distance, because everybody is all single file coming and going from the, from the airport. So anyway, we got on the funicular. Uh, the, um, you can see that they've loaded up bicycles. There were some brave souls who were going to go from the top of the mountain and take themselves down. And you see this a lot in the cities. When we woke up in the morning, <clears throat> especially on the uh, downtown on the weekends, you see lots of people on bicycles. In fact, I think one day uh, there was um, Palm Sunday, there was actually uh, a group of bicyclists. They were having some kind of a race in town, and so the, the streets were all blocked off. But even this day when we got up, uh, you see people all dressed in their clothes and uh, sports clothes ready to take off on their bicycles for adventures. And you can see part of that. You know, the other thing is, is the president closed down, closes down every Sunday the main streets in the city and there's no cars allowed because he wanted them to get back into better physical conditions. So you have to either walk or ride your bike. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, one other little. <laughs> yeah. You have to point it at them. Oh. <laughs> okay. And this is, in fact, what we saw when we got to the top. This is Quito. Uh, there's old Quito and new Quito, and I can't tell you how many millions of people are packed into here. Uh, Jackie can tell you the story behind this. This is one of the little churches that we saw directly uh, off the path that uh, we arrived in. But this is typical of the countryside that you're seeing around here. Well, I asked, why was this church? You know, you're in the middle of n nothing up here, and why it was here, there is... Um, there were two children that were lost in the forest, and it's very thick and dense in the forest. And they had a priest that walked them in, down to this area. And when they turned around, there was nobody there. So they built this in honor of the priest that saved the children from being in the forest. Uh, we had taken, after we got off the funicular and got done there, they took us next to the cultural center. And this is actually, ground zero or the center of the world. We're now standing on the equator and some of the, it's a um, different um, buildings and huts and articles of antiquity uh, that represent the culture and the development of Ecuador. And you can see some of the carvings and things that have been collected. Uh, this is, uh, one of our guides that day, and you can see Jackie in the background, we're, we're learning to do the native dances. So when in Rome, join the Romans. Uh, we 
toured the city and ended up actually directly in the city. We're looking over the main square and some of the government buildings. This is Sunday, and uh, one of the cultural traditions is that everybody gathers in the squares on Sunday. This is the big social time. And you'll see them actually coming, lots of people coming down all the streets. And actually, they're heading for the main square. And you can see that you are on a hill. It's, it's not quite as steep in some areas as San Francisco, but it is it's fairly mountainous. Whoop. Uh, did I do it? I don't know. There, there we go. go. Uh, one of the squares consists of nothing but cathedrals and churches, and this is probably the biggest. Uh, they were all built, of course, by the um, conquistadors and uh, the Spaniards that came in. Uh, they're very, very ornate. When you look around the countryside and you look around at some of the other buildings outside of Quito that were very plain, and then you come in here and see the, the, the magnificent cathedrals. I think there were like seven of them in this area. This is the uh, presidential palace. The president does not live there, but it's on the main square and the oldest square in Quito. The yeah. Actually, what was interesting about the president is that he changed his term and added that he can stay in office. Um, he also sued the country um, over something that happened at the bank and built his own uh, home in the community. So it was just interesting. Uh, we ended up in the bishop's residence for dinner. And uh, it's a uh, one of the oldest buildings in Quito. Uh, there are uh, four, three to four floors, and you start out, uh, and it's open to the public. It's all dining and gift shops now. And they have some of the um, portraits you can see on the side and some of the religious articles that were uh, used by the bishop during the time. The steps to get up to each floor are wooden. You can almost imagine the clergy uh, going up and down the stairs in their robes and things. But uh, the main floor is like fast food dining. We were on the second floor. It's all uh, local food and as you go up to the third and fourth floor the the dining becomes just a little more finer a little more service uh, we were on the third floor here uh, with our guide directly sitting behind us we were uh, you can't see him in this particular time but directly ended up sitting behind us we heard English being spoken and um, German and we turned around and the gentleman was in a tuxedo turned out he was an expat he was part of the Ecuadorian the Quito Symphony and uh, he and his wife were having dinner they were beginning uh, he was taking part in a uh, series of concerts that were being uh, offered up to the um, Ecuadorians during Holy Week and he invited us to join them and of course they're being held in the cathedrals which is uh, one of their main gathering spots. Remember he said how long he, yeah. He was also telling us how long he had to wait to get his money back from his taxes, you know. I think he uh, waited what, he'd already been six or eight months and he still had not received his money. So he was complaining about that to us. <laughs> Uh, this is the gift shop, probably the most uh, on the second floor, and you can't see it here. I, I'm not sure whether Jackie included it. But as it was, it was Holy Week, and as we were going to our seats, right where we were kind of positioned right where we are right now, we passed this. If you can remember what Ku Klux Klan was all about, uh, there was a model dressed in a huge, almost Ku Klux Klan outfit, only it was purple. Turns out it's part of the tradition of Holy Week uh, that takes place on Thursday before um, Good Friday. Here's part of the um, cuisine. Uh, these are plantains, which as you know are bananas that have been fried. Uh, this is uh, cauliflower soup, and instead of crackers, they always offered uh, popcorn, which we kind of got used to in life. <laughs> this is the main square. You can see all the people gathering. Uh, there were mimes. There's uh, little kiosks with food. Uh, <clears throat> lots of dogs, uh, people leading their animals around, uh, and families together just sitting, talking, socializing. Oh, my God. <laughs> One of this, this is in the cathedrals. Oh, 
we were there uh, another day, and then we got ready, and we uh, ended up heading for the Galapagos Islands. And here we are again. We had another adventure. You fly on a plane, land on an island, get on a bus, and uh, then you walk to the uh, dock, and then you get on a Zodiac or a rubber raft. Uh, ours was Archipel. This is a World Heritage Site. It's very controlled. Uh, many, many rules which we did not understand. We were just following what our guides told us um, because it is a, a, pres a very fragile area. People are, so many people can be on a boat, so many, you can only be on an island so long. We were on the main island. There are probably about three to 400 people living here. We're getting on the uh, uh, Zodiac in order to go out and pick up our boat. This, they had taken us to one of the, um, scientific centers where they're doing some research and of course uh, explaining to everybody what's going on. These are, the Galapagos is not just one island, it's many, many islands together. And each one has its own personality. Uh, what you see here are our, the two boats named Archipel. We were Archipel too. Probably one of the fun cruises I've been on, there were only 15 passengers and probably about five or six crew. They're huge catamarans. That's uh, one of our young men, and they function as a bartender, and uh, they'll help uh, get you on and off the Zodiacs and uh, do a number of activities here. Uh, this is a very cosmopolitan group. Um, there was a family, you see a young man over here, uh, two brothers and their parents, they were from Switzerland. Dad was in the um, Swiss government, and they were living in Bogota. Okay, and then you see some of the others. There was a young couple from England going around the world. The couple you see standing up was from um, Montana, actually. It's top of our boat. Here's our cabin. We all had private baths. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can see us uh, on the islands. This is typical of one of the islands. This is a blue-footed booby. You can see the sea lions. They were everywhere. This is Jackie. No, that's Connie. Oh, Connie, excuse me. <laughs> this is me. That's me. And uh, typical, this is the famous tortoise. That I, I think we're being cut off. Really, really okay. Fast. <laughs> Don't talk anymore. No talking. <laughs> no talking. This is the one post office on the island. This is a frigate bird. Yeah. <laughs> Land tortoise. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> you may see some of your friends here. We were invaded by f uh, over a hundred dolphins. Yeah, we were invaded by over a hundred dolphins at one point. Yeah. Yeah. Oh well. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we can shut off. Okay. Have to come back. Yeah, I know. Part two. Ed, real fast, has an announcement. Ribbon cutting for the Malson Athletic Center will be at 4 o'clock um, this coming Saturday. Family fun night. We have set up from 1 to 3. The event is for families with young children from 5.30 to 8.30. $10 for kids and parents are free. Um, on the 20th, we have the Hall of Fame breakfast. And uh, Friday's the deadline, so anybody's interested in that, just contact me. I'm the only Sogan in the book. Thank you. And you're here. Okay, moving right along quickly. I don't have my glasses. So <laughs> I Only at Rotary. <laughs> it's only been five years. <laughs> oh! But $12. Okay. All right. Thank you.